Hi, um, so uh, with one student here, and hopefully many people are watching online, um, uh, we're gonna do variational autoencoders. So how are they different from autoencoders that we just learned in lecture um, pretty recently is that they have this probabilistic component and they have also uh, incorporate a prior over your uh, latent vector. So we'll, we'll go more de detail into that later, but so, uh, what is a variational autoencoder? It's essentially, uh, uh, again, a nonlinear dimensional re reduction technique because uh, essentially what you're doing is you're trying to uh, compress all your information into a couple of latent variables and then you're uh, uh, reconstructing your input back. And that's, that's, the, that's the main idea behind autoencoders. And the idea is, is if you do that, then uh, you will be able to capture the, uh, most of the variation in the data. So, but the difference is that the uh, VAE is a generative model. So you're kind of saying that, okay, uh, you're assuming that uh, you have this latent variable and uh, that can be used to generate your, uh, most, of your, most of your data. So if you see this uh, probabilistic graphical model here, you have a hidden variable and uh, that, that's, that's producing some uh, observed variable. So the arrow goes from Z to X. So the uh, main hypothesis is that, I think there's a part of the text that got cut, but uh, yeah, there's a latent variable Z that can be used to be generate the data uh, that explains ma the main sources of variation. And uh, the idea is we want to incorporate a prior for this Z as a regularization objective. But what is variational? I didn't really explain that. We will cover that soon. So uh, let's, let's go on. Uh, so in, this was the image that on the left, uh, what do you saw for autoencoders, you have this encoder that takes your input and compresses it into a couple of uh, neurons that's basically just a hidden layer in the middle. And then you're reconstructing it back in the decoder. And uh, so the hypothesis is that the hidden representation in uh, autoencoders is basically the same as, uh, kind of the same interpretation as uh, latent variable in uh, VAEs. Why? Uh, because uh, mathematically latent variables are supposed to uh, the, uh, the, the definition of latent variables is that they are some hidden unobserved thing that can be used to uh, explain your, the variation in your data. And hi in hidden representations, what you're doing is uh, you're trying to capture this uh, lower dimensional manifold, right? That uh, you are uh, projecting your data to lower, lower dimensions and you're saying that, okay, uh, similar examples should lie close to each other in that uh, manifold. So, uh, one example, uh, simple example that I, li I like to think of is let's say you're looking at uh, images and uh, you're encoding, autoencoding uh, cats and dogs versus books and pen. Maybe there's one hidden neuron that captures that, uh, oh, this thing has a leg or has a face or something. So uh, this neuron would be on for uh, cats and dogs, but this neuron would be off for a uh, book or pen. So this is, this is, the, this is the main idea. And, uh, they will be, uh, so you, you, th these latent variables will capture all the, uh, hopefully capture all the semantic information that can be used to generate your uh, original uh, input back. Um, and this is the main idea in PCA also, right? That you are uh, basically projecting into a space. It's a linear model that projects it to a space where uh, explains, explains most of the data, meaning that uh, you're capturing most of the variance in the, in the data. So, Let's first do, uh, uh, the, the variational autoencoder is a Bayesian way of doing things. So let's first do a recap of the Bayes theorem. So uh, in, uh, you have three main terms, right? The prior, likelihood, and a posterior. So we are defining a prior over your latent variable. Uh, how likely is a certain value of the latent variable Z? Um, our likelihood, which is Px given Z, is the given a certain value of Z, how likely is a data point? So, uh, given a certain value of uh, a couple of neur neurons, then how likely is a cat image to be generated or how likely is a book image to be generated from that latent variable? Uh, and posterior is given an original data point, what is the probability of that latent variable? So uh, a base, if, you, if I express this in the Bayes theorem, this, this looks like uh, this formula, which is, which is pretty simple. And uh, I would suggest like, so everything of variational Bayes and stuff, uh, this link below is, is, is a great uh, read to go to. So in our case, uh, PZ, let's, let's say we choose that to be a simple uh, distribution, like a standard Gaussian. We can uh, easily uh, evaluate things on that. So 
uh, let's let's just keep it simple. And it works well because it just says that you know, uh, if I say it's uh, normal with mean zero and a standard deviation one, uh, then all your all your data is kind of uh, concentrated around this unit hypersphere. Um, then you have likelihood, which is uh, the decoder part of our network. So we can easily parameterize this using using just a normal neural network. And uh, let's say if you have uh, binary outputs at the uh, at the last, then you can have uh, sigmoid neurons, or you can have uh, just linear neurons for real valued outputs and so on. Um, for the posterior, we are going to try to do this in the encoder part of the network. Now, why I say try is because it's very difficult to calculate this posterior. So uh, you have this px term in the denominator, and how you get that is by marginalizing over all pos over the joint of px and z. Right? So you either take an integral over all possible values of z, or you take a, if it's a discrete, if z is discrete, then you can take a sum over all possible values of z. But this is really in, uh, intractable to, to compute. You, you can't do this in a real uh, world setting. You can't possibly take a sum of all um, real values. So what we do is variational base. So what uh, happens in this is that we want this, let's say we have a qz, which is easy to parameterize that uh, we can uh, maybe just uh, an, another Gaussian. But uh, let's say we can use that to approximate uh, Pz given x. So uh, how can we know that this distribution is a good approximation? Is uh, this thing called Kale divergence. So Kale divergence, I'm, I'm, going more, I'm gonna go more into detail into this later. But uh, Kale divergence is basically a kind of a distance metric. Uh, it's not exactly a distance metric because it's not symmetric. And uh, there's a whole book on Kale divergence. But um, uh, the idea is that uh, you want to capture how dissimilar two uh, probability distributions are. So, uh, so now what we are saying is that our encoder is basically this Q uh, distribution. We are, we are outputting uh, this Q distribution, and then we are, uh, we'll be sampling a Z from that, and then that will go to, uh, to the decoder. But then we don't really know uh, how well our uh, Q uh, parameterization is, right? So uh, let's, let's, sorry, let's first do, uh, go into Kale divergence. Let's uh, consider entropy, uh, which is basically uh, this function, which is summation over all values of x, probability of x, times uh, log probability of px. Now in Kale divergence, what happens is that uh, you are, this is also, so let's say you have q z z given x log q z given z given x, but you also have a minus term where you're doing minus log p z z given x. So um, what that leads to is that uh, Kale divergence has many many interpretations. Uh, some people say that oh you know it's the number of bits of information lost if we use uh, uh, distribution q to uh, represent uh, samples from distribution p. Uh, or it can be the negative log likelihood that samples generated by distribution P has actually been generated by Q. So it's kind of like a, uh, uh, it's, it's mostly rooted in information theory that, uh, okay, uh, how much information am I losing by uh, using this uh, other um, uh, distribution instead as an approximation? And the note is that Kale divergence will always be positive, and this will come uh, important, uh, this will be important soon uh, in, in our VA formulation. So before uh, this, this becomes scary, so let's say uh, now we are, what we're trying to do is uh, we want to look more into what this scale divergence term is. This scale divergence between our proposed uh, posterior, which is QZ, and our actual posterior, which is PZ given X. So that, that is this, um, this equation basically. So this decomposes through a lot of math, which uh, we can't possibly go through in the recitation, uh, into the, these, these two terms. So we have a log p of x, which is the log likelihood of the, of the data. And uh, the basic idea in order encoders or any unsupervised techniques are that you want to maximize px, because uh, you want to have some parameterization of the probability distribution of your data that best explains the uh, samples that you have observed. So let's say you're flipping a coin and you're flipping a biased coin. Uh, if you say your probability of heads is 0 0.5, your prob uh, that doesn't explain uh, your samples very well because you're maybe going to have a lot more heads than tails. So you would probably want to bias your um, uh, binomial distribution P to be 
closer to maybe, let's say, 0 0.75, then that's probably closer to uh, explaining your um, observed samples. And this blue part is called the variational lower bound. So remember the red part we want to maximize, and the blue part is called the variational lower bound. So what we're going to do is, uh, so KL divergence equals to this minus this, the, uh, the log likelihood minus the variational lower bound. We're going to bring the variational lower bound on the other side, on the KL divergence side. Uh, and with this rearranging, we get uh, uh, this kind of a formula. There, there's a log missing here. We need to fix that. But anyway, so it's log P of X equals to this term L, which is our variational lower bound, uh, plus the original KL divergence we had. And now remember I said that KL divergence is always greater than zero. So it's kind of like an error term. And uh, th therefore, th this means that L is kind of a lower bound for uh, our log likelihood, right? So uh, we have, let's say, our, uh, uh, yeah, our, our uh, variational lower bound here. KL divergence is something that's positive. That means our uh, actual log likelihood of data is somewhere here. So uh, if we, if the more we increase uh, L, the variational lower bound, we are bound to increase uh, the, uh, the log likelihood of data. So that means uh, as we increase this uh, variational lower bound, we are learning to better represent and uh, draw samples from our data. So uh, when is this bound very tight? Um, that's when uh, QZ is almost similar to um, which is a proposed distribution to our actual posterior. So uh, think about this like if, you, if, you are, uh, if your KL divergence is zero, then your PX and your uh, variational lower bound are almost similar. So the more you uh, raise that, the, the faster you can uh, increase your log likelihood of data. So you'll be better able to uh, uh, train your model if your bounds are tight. And that's a whole uh, area of research. How do you make your um, variational lower bounds tight? So. There, there were two terms in that variational lower bound, right? Um, there, there's this expectation and a KL divergence term. So uh, in that, uh, if, if, we, if we look at it, these two terms separately, uh, the first one, the expectation, is kind of like a reconstruction error. So PX given Z is uh, uh, given a latent variable. You have uh, tried to reconstruct the input. And what is the log likelihood of that? So how do you uh, calculate that? You can, um, you can basically take your ground truth and you are basically out, uh, your decoder is also outputting a distribution. So uh, then, then you can uh, compute your log likelihood of, of, of uh, log, um, yeah, log likelihood of that. So in traditional autoencoders, we use the L2 loss, right? Uh, with binary data, uh, uh, this, this log likelihood term basically turns out to be uh, binary cross entropy loss. And with real value data for VAs, we can say that PX given Z is a Gaussian distribution. And if you, if, you see, if you think about it, if you take a log of a Gaussian distribution and you look at the important terms in that, that, that basically kind of um, boils down to uh, L2 loss. And then the second term uh, is the more important term uh, that people talk about in uh, VAEs, which is the regularization term. Uh, you don't want the latent variable values to be all over the place. You, want, um, you have your beliefs that, oh, you're, you know, my latent variable values should be uh, uh, should be distributed like this. Uh, so basically, without this term, this is as good as a normal autoencoder. So uh, with the Gaussian prior, we are basically saying it's centered about zero. Um, and it's, that, that's a generally a good place to start, but this does not always work well. We'll uh, uh, go into this later. But um, yeah. Okay. Oh, right, yeah. Thank you, Soham. So basically, um, we did skip through some math, um, but we're, we're going to actually be putting up a lecture, the uh, lecture that, that we missed on Monday, which is going to sort of get more into the meat of the uh, uh, math behind VAE, as, as well as some more motivation, although Soham's motivated VAE very well so far. Um, so, so right now, I'm going to kind of take a step back, um, and we're going to take another perspective uh, on the elbow, the evidence lower bound that we just talked about. Um, so I'm going to do a bit of math on, on the board, 
Can I use this board? Yeah. All right. So from what we've, what we've done before, we've seen these terms without including the parameters. Um, but w what we've shown so far is that the uh, evidence lower bound is something like this. So this is the log likelihood given our, our, our parameters. Uh, you know, this could be some linear model or a deep neural network. And then here's our Kale divergence term. And this is the Kale divergence between our proposal dis distribution and our uh, posterior here. PZ of uh, X theta. So given our model and, 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 and the data, uh, what is the probability of, of our latent variable here? All right, so we can actually think of this um, in, in terms of the EM algorithm, if you're, you're familiar with that. So we can actually set up our, oh, did we lose the slides? We're gonna do a, let's see, yeah, all right. So if you remember from, from EM, we have this thing called the, the expectation step um, where we are actually going to try to uh, maximize this, this, this value here. And the way that we're going to do it is we're, we're going to do it iteratively. We're first going to maximize over QT. Uh, sorry, uh, yes, uh, over Q. So we're, we're going to uh, learn QT or uh, optimize for a Q at, at time step T of the algorithm by finding the uh, maximum Q uh, when we fix our, our parameters. And looking at this equation here, um, log P of X theta uh, is in independent of Q. The only thing that we can hope to optimize here uh, is, the, is the Kale divergence in terms of Q here. Um, and we know that the, Kale, that the minimum of the Kale divergence is zero. So when is, it, when is this term zero? Well, it's actually exactly when um, QT is equal to uh, our, our posterior. All right, so we actually just go ahead and fix this here. And now what we can say is um, is so the M step, we now fix QT and we, we derive theta of T plus one um, and after a little bit of math here, I'm going to spoil it for you, we get an expectation over our new proposal distribution of the log of the, uh, of the joint. All right. So basically, what, we're, what we, what we want to show here, ultimately, is that we are um, constantly uh, lower bounding our likelihood and then um, in increasing it iteratively. So we're not guaranteed a, gl a global solution, but we're guaranteed a local solution. And, and, and I, I can show this. Let's see, I'm running out, out of room quickly. Um, but by the M step, we have this. We have L of QT. And we know here that L of QT of theta T minus one um, here is the point at which we've set this term to zero. So it's, we simply have, have, have this here on the right-hand side of the, of the inequality. 
So this becomes All right, so we have this now. And, and now, let's substitute something in here, which we know is just the, yeah. We're going to get back to a more visual interpretation of this in a second. As we said, this is greater than log of the likelihood of our previous parameter set. So what's this here? Well, as we showed here, this is QT. This is, this is, this is QT minus 1. This is QT. Um, and we set them to be the same in the uh, E step. So this just goes to 0. And so now we have this really nice property So we have shown that for each iteration of the EM algorithm here, that the log li likelihood of our, uh, of our data given our parameters uh, is always greater than or equal to uh, the parameters, that, that for the parameters of the previous step. And we can see that, that graphically here, that given this relation, um, the uh, sum of the uh, elbow and the, the Kale divergence between our uh, proposal and our posterior must always sum up to the log likelihood. So we can see that now when we set Q equal to P, uh, this gets pushed up here. Uh, the elbow uh, must take up all of the, the likelihood. And then we can optimize and push our uh, uh, elbow up. And what that will actually do is, is then uh, separate the distributions uh, of the proposal and um, our current likelihood during this optimization um, by, by uh, something greater than or, or e equal to zero uh, in terms of Kale divergence. And we're just going to keep repeat, repeating this um, iteratively. So like this um, and, and ends up working out uh, when um, your, your, your uh, elbow and the Kale divergence are uh, quadratic. Um, but it's not necessarily so simple um, how, 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 how we can do this um, in, in a neural network, especially when we have, when we have this term, the expectation uh, over Q. Um, so basically, this uh, expectation can be computed empirically using Monte Carlo sampling. Um, and, but like, how can we make this differentiable, um, especially in, in, in a neural network if you have a st stochastic uh, uh, sampling operation? So this is where the, the common reparameterization trick comes in. So if we, if we have some distribution, say, say a Gaussian, parameterized by some um, mu and variance, uh, mean and variance, uh, Im Im imagine here that we had a neural network, and mu is the activity um, at, a, at some layer, and the variance is also the, the activity um, of some, uh, the same size of components uh, of that layer. Um, what we can actually do here is we can transform the expectation uh, over samples uh, from those activations, and we can just uh, actually take a fixed 
random variable. Uh, here, simply, we're just going to use standard normal uh, for, uh, for, for a Gaussian. And now we have a deterministic output for our network. And then we simply take the expectation over this fixed ran random variable. Um, and for, for a Gaussian, this is simply a uh, scalar multiplication and addition. Um, do you want to do a, do a recap? Yep. Okay, so now let's uh, take a look at the full picture again. So you have an input coming in, X, that goes through a couple of hidden layers um, and, and stuff, and then what you have is you have two outputs. You're, you want to output a mean and um, a standard deviation, but usually because standard deviation needs to be always positive, people uh, like to output the log of uh, variance. So uh, then, but then, then, then you can calculate standard deviation from that. And what you do is you sample a z, but you sample this from a standard normal distribution. So then uh, you don't need to care about the, uh, the mu and sigma yet. So once you sample this epsilon, then you can transform this epsilon into z using this operation, the, the just mu plus uh, the standard deviation element-wise multiplied with the uh, sample you just got. And that's your sample dating vector. Then you can use that to uh, put that in the probabilistic decoder, which Again, output, outputs uh, um, a probability distribution. Like uh, for binary out, uh, outputs, it will uh, output the uh, Bernoulli distribution p, a value p. So uh, that's and that's what we are going to see uh, in the example later for uh, MNIST uh, for the practical part of this recitation. But um, two things that I want to point out is uh, currently uh, people what people are looking at in research is. The Kiel divergence term is a strong prior for the latent variable values, which uh, say that, oh, you know, my latent values lie in this hypersphere of, uh, of things. But uh, what if this is actually not true? So, for example, if we, if we generated samples using the figure that's in A, uh, if we use the normal uh, uh, VAE, the C, we, we just learned mostly about C, uh, this one. Uh, we are going to get uh, the latent variables learned like this, which is obviously not uh, what we were looking for. So uh, you can either uh, reduce the uh, reliance on the Kiel divergence term by using beta equals 0, 0 0.1 and multiplying that to the Kiel divergence term, or you can use a different term called the, this, this, is, uh, this is one paper, uh, it's called the spherical VAE. So in this, their uh, underlying prior is the von Mises Fisher distribution, which we, uh, which is pretty interesting, and I don't understand it that well too, so I'm not going to go into it. Um, but uh, and also another thing is that uh, how do we force latent representations to be more meaningful? So uh, what we would want to see is uh, hopefully, let's say, in uh, one important uh, application is uh, uh, in my research I've seen is uh, latent variables in dialogue. So let's say you you have this hierarchical. Um, uh, dialogue RNN, and what you want to see is that uh, this latent variable is basically telling you um, is this uh, uh, ca capturing information about dialogue acts, or oh, is this an opinion question, is this uh, um, a statement of fact, or, uh, or, or something like that. So uh, we would want to capture these variations without having any label data. So that's where latent variables come in. But then you want, you want these to be meaningful because uh, you want to actually have interpretable neural networks. So um, that's where disentangling comes in. There's a typo there. Uh, where we are saying that each latent variable should capture very different information from another. So think of this in terms of PCA. Each projection, we want it to be orthogonal to uh, the, all the other projections. So um, uh, we want them to be. Uh, the, the latent variables to be as uncorrelated with each other as possible. So the main idea in um, uh, a very simple paper uh, called Beta VAE is that um, you just scale the Kiel divergence term a lot more. So they, they use a uh, beta value of uh, 250. And this forces the posterior that you have, the QZ given X, to be very highly factorized. Because what you're, say, you're saying your prior is this 
diagonal uh, covariance matrix. Uh, and uh, because you're incorp incorporating that a lot, it forces the posterior to be also very highly factorized, so which means that the covariance terms outside of the diagonals are, are very close to zero. So this means that the latent dimensions are more or less uh, uncorrelated. And um, that gives a lot of uh, interesting results uh, in this paper. I will, I will add a link to this paper on the slide uh, later. But, uh, so the main concepts to remember in VA before we go into the practical part is that uh, in VAs, you need to have two tractable uh, distributions. One is the PZ, which is the prior of the latent variable, and PX given Z, which is the likelihood given the uh, latent variable. So these are two things that you need to define yourself. Um, and uh, for, for different uh, applications, different things will make sense. Uh, we can train VAs using backprop because of that reparametrization trick that you can convert a standard sample into the sample that you're looking for using a um, differentiable operation. Uh, VAs are very similar to EM. Um, uh, the, you're, you're basically lower bounding something and increasing the lower bound. Uh, we can make VAs tighter, uh, better by uh, obtaining tighter definitions of the lower bound. And one example of this is the importance weighted autoencoders. And um, choosing a good prior matters because um, you, uh, you, it, you need to incorporate information about how you think your latent variables should be um, uh, distributed. So, uh, and weighting prior differently also gives uh, disentanglement results. So I think, yeah, that's all the slides we have. So let's move on to the practical part of this. I'm going to move this here. OK, so uh, what we're going to do in this recitation is we're going to try to train a VA for, um, for uh, uh, MNIST images. So uh, MNIST images are basically uh, 28 by 28 uh, uh, images of which, are, which are binary because they're basically between 0 and 1. And for that, what we're going to do is um, we're going to use uh, Torch Vision data sets. You have this MNIST data sets. And I'm going to create one for train and create one for test. And uh, oh, okay, cool. Is this good? Okay, so uh, uh, we went through this a little in the in the CNN recitation as well. Uh, what you would want to do is uh, you can create this data set and you can uh, also um, have this transform. So I'm tr composing a two tensor transform because. Um, this data set gives me first PIL images, and then I can, that this con, uh, then the two tensor converts it into a PyTorch tensor. And I want to flatten that because uh, I'm not really doing anything convolutional. I'm just going to look at the uh, flattened uh, 784 sized uh, vector. So, so here is where uh, we're going to define our model. So uh, there, there, there are going to be a par uh, couple of parts of it. So what we want to do is we want to have an encoding function. Uh, we want to have a decoding thing. Uh, our forward does the encoding and the decoding and the sampling. So the sampling is uh, is here. And uh, we want to calculate loss, which involves this uh, KL divergence loss, which you can calculate here. And uh, the reconstruction loss is just um, binary cross entropy loss because remember we are we are generating. Um, binary data, so we you can you can parameterize uh, your output distribution to be a Bernoulli distribution, and you're just outputting the p value p, which is the uh, of of the Bernoulli. So, uh, so this 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 is a VA with one hidden layer in the middle. So you have x, which is 784, then that go, goes to a hidden layer, uh, which is um, uh, size 512. Then from the uh, then then we add a ReLU, and then from this hidden, we have a linear layer which outputs the mu. And we also have a linear layer which outputs the um, log of the variance of um, this. So uh, we, we have a Gaussian encoder, 
we are outputting a Gaussian distribution for our latent variables. And then what we're going to do is, using the sampled z, we're going to uh, first have the z to h, which is, again, uh, something from the uh, latent number of latent dimensions to um, the um, to number of hidden variables, which, uh, hidden neurons, which is 512. And then from that hidden, we want to, again, project it back to um, uh, 784, which is the h to x. And uh, once you do that, we want to apply a sigmoid on top of that. So uh, here I uh, initialize all my, all my parameters here. And uh, what I'm going to do for this recitation is we're going to use uh, just two latent dimensions because that makes it easier to plot and, and kind of see uh, what the results are. Uh, this won't give us the best uh, results in terms of rec reconstruction, and you're going to see that. But uh, we can at least plot and see nice, cool things. So uh, how, we, how we do this is uh, the, the encoding and decoding are, are, are pretty, pretty simple, right? Uh, you just, uh, it's just a couple of linear layers. And uh, for encoding, you're outputting both mu and log variance. For decoding, you're taking an h and uh, outputting the reconstructed x. But in forward, you have to, uh, the important part is uh, the reprior parameterization trick, right? Which is um, how do you sample the z? So uh, what, what we have is the outputs of the encoding, uh, which is mu and log variance. So first, I'm going to uh, take uh, epsilon, which is um, a random normal, uh, uh, a random normal variable, which is, which is of size of mu, uh, mu, which is of the same size as mu. So uh, because I haven't given any mu and uh, variance here, this will be a standard uh, distribution. Uh, this will just be normal 0, 1. And um, I want to send it to CUDA if I need to. And uh, here is where I'm converting the epsilon into my z. So I'm, add, I'm first uh, taking my log variance and multiplying it by 0 0.5. Uh, which, so you have to realize that, uh, so 0 0.5 times uh, log of variance is log of square root of the variance, no, no, sorry, uh, uh, 0 0.5 times log of variance is, what is it again? 0 0.5 times log variance is log of square root. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. 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 Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So uh, I mean, uh, yeah. So the, the sig sigma basically equals to 0 0.5 times log uh, log of variance, and then uh, you basically exponentiate that in here, and that's so. First, you do eps you're multiplying that epsilon with sigma, and then you're adding that to mu, and that that returns your z, and this is a fully differentiable operation. So that's the uh, thing and uh, in terms of loss function, we have two things. We have the KLD loss, which is uh, again because you have um, you're saying your your prior is uh, a Gaussian distribution and your uh, generated uh, QZ given X is also a Gaussian distribution. You can very easily you have an analytical um, very nice mathematical expression for KL divergence, which we we will probably go through in more in detail in in the lecture itself. Uh, um, how do you how do you actually uh, come up with this formula? But uh, this is uh, this is very easy to uh, calculate. So uh, again, and this is also uh, differentiable. So everything is uh, differentiable, which means we can basically train with uh, our your favorite uh, optimizer, SGD, uh, Adam, whatever. Uh, I think I have Adam here. So here I'm gonna I'm gonna train, which is which is basically very simple. Um, just Taking x, I'm uh, sending it a device. I'm first getting, I'm getting my mu log variance z and x reconstructed. Uh, I'm going to calculate my loss using that, do backward and stuff. So this is very simple stuff. You should, you guys should know this by now. Um, and I'm going to, so uh, what I have from the losses is basically the value of the elbows, and this is, uh, sorry, uh, I have the negative of the elbow, which is our loss function. And because we want to maximize elbow, we take the negative of the elbow as our loss function. So in this mean losses, I'm appending the negative of that, which means I'm, I'm actually getting the elbow values here. So uh, I would like to plot that in here. And if you see that, uh, uh, here you get basically the elbow is always rising up. 
which means that, um, and, and you should see this. If you don't see this, there's probably a bug in your VAE code. Um, that uh, you should always see um, your lower bound keeping on rising uh, through, the, uh, through the epochs. Um, and, and basically, it kind of, kind of tapers off at the end. So, um, so let's see how our V does actually in terms of reconstruction of the MNIST images. So this is, again, I've created a new data loader and just basically I'm, I'm getting one batch of uh, 100 here of the um, uh, images X and uh, labels Y. I don't need to care about the labels. So um, I have this function visualize, uh, which uh, uh, takes all these Xs and then, and then puts them in a grid. Uh, this uses torch vision um, make grid function, which is pretty useful for computer vision stuff uh, to visualize things. So, uh, so these are the uh, original MNIST images. And for these, I'm going to pass that to the network, and I'm going to get the reconstructed X. And I'm going to visualize these, visualize these again uh, in, in, in using this function. And you see, so uh, the first thing you might notice is that uh, these VA samples are kind of blurry. Uh, they, uh, especially like something uh, like this, this 5 here, um, this 9 here, you don't really know, is this a 9, is this a 4? Um, so uh, this is one known problem of VAEs that uh, they tend to be blurry. So that, that's how do you make it better is it, it can be a complete lecture again. So I'm not going to go into that. But uh, this, this is a known problem of VAEs. And also we are using just two latent dimensions, which is probably not enough to capture uh, uh, all, the, all the information in the, in, in the data. So, uh, and you can probably see that's, I think, let's look at an example, I think. Um, this was a nine, but, okay, this was fine. Um, four and four here. Yeah, so see, th this four kind of got, uh, here kind of got confused with a nine here. So, um, we are prob uh, we are probably gonna see this uh, later in the plot as well, uh, the latent uh, space plot. So, since we have uh, just two latent dimensions, we can just plot them on a 2D plot. And ideally, we, we should see uh, separation between the clusters of the different digits. So uh, here I have, um, I took my test data, and uh, then I plotted all the, all the latent va variable values I got uh, on this scatter plot and colored them by the, um, by the digit that we have. So you can see 4 is this, this green thing here. And nine is this brown thing. So you see, four and nine are almost very close to each other. So it's very likely that four and nine samples will be will be very confused with each uh, with each other. And um, so uh, the only two samples which are very well separated, I would say, is probably this zero here. Zeros are very well separated, and ones also are very well separated. So. Uh, my intuition behind this is that uh, in, if, if you're doing an autoencoder for uh, images like things for, let's say, MNIST, um, you would have a couple of neurons maybe encoding the fact that there's one loop or there, there are two loops um, uh, or there's just uh, how many straight lines are there, how many curves are there. Um, so I guess it basically in two dimensions, it's, it's not enough to capture all that. And if you think about it, four. And nine, the only difference is kind of that, that small loop uh, at, uh, that closes the, the nine uh, at the top. So it's, it's understandable that the VA kind of gets confused uh, uh, trying, to, trying to do something like that. Um, and also you can see that, uh, so this is, this is zero, zero, zero is right here. So you can see that, yeah, uh, all my latent vari uh, variable values are kind of centered around zero, zero. Um, they don't really venture out that far. So my prior kind of works. So uh, you could actually try training this with beta equal to 0 0.1, and you'll see more spreading, um, and you'll th see more uh, separation as well. But um, I don't think I have time to really show that. Uh, actually, maybe I can let it run. Um, so I'm going to change this to beta equal to 0 0.1. And run all of it, all of this. Okay, but there's one thing I want to so, show is that um, the interesting property of VAEs is, uh, and order encoders in general is the uh, smoothness in the latent space. So um, what I, what I can do is I, I can look at this graph and see that my latent variables uh, mostly lie between 
minus 3 and 3 for this dimension and also minus 3 and 3 for this dimension. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the minimum and maximum of these and then I'm going to uh, uh, gener I'm going to make a grid of z values within these minimum and maximum and generate images using these uh, z values. And <coughs> if you s plot this, this is, this is what you can see. So uh, uh, if you, there might be some flipping uh, happening, but anyways, uh, if you see these ones here, that uh, kind of corresponds with the ones that, um, this, this blue ones that you see, uh, see here. So there is sort of a correspondence, and then uh, as you increase um, in one dimension, uh, your the one kind of turns slowly into a v uh, into into a five, and if you increase along the uh, y dimension, then uh, it turns almost into a seven, and um, you can see that in this in this latent space as well, they are, they are kind of uh, you can see how the the transitions occur, right? Uh, you have these fours here, and they are almost confused with uh, nines, and uh, the very similar looking digits are clustered uh, in a similar way. So 9 and 7, all, uh, also very similar. Uh, all that's missing is uh, either, is it a loop or just a straight line? So um, they're, they're close to each other here as well. And 0, uh, as you saw that 0, the separation between uh, uh, the cluster for 0 is very, diff uh, is very good as compared to the rest of the uh, latent samples. So you can see 0 reconstruction is really, really good. And similarly for um, one as well, it's, it's pretty decent. So uh, the things that get confused are basically seven, nine, and four, threes, and twos, and sixes, and so on, yeah. So that's pretty much it. Let's see how much it trained. So uh, you'll see that these elbow values are always increasing from uh, some negative value to some positive. Uh, it, it'll never go positive, but anyways because it's log likelihood, so. Yeah, we could either wait for this to train or, <laughs> I don't know. How much time do you think? So each epoch takes like 18 seconds. Uh, I could probably stop it at 20 and, 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 and see. Did you like go through something else like Galileo or something? Okay, Maybe. can you go through that? Um, I can just join the board. People can still put up with my handwriting. All right, everyone. So while we let this train, um, I'm just going to do a quick review of kale divergence um, in case people haven't encountered it before. Um, See where's the, where did I put it? Okay. Let's get a, new, get a new piece of chalk. Um, all right, so if people haven't seen this before, um, in information theory, there's this idea about information gain. Um, so the idea is that, is, is that if we have an event P, uh, the amount sorry not, not information gain the, the amount of, the amount of information um, is the log of one over the probability. And if this is base two, you can think about this of units and bits. Um, but generally, people end up using base E and uh, the natural log, and people call these units of nats. And if um, we take the expectation of the information, um, of a distribution, of uh, the, the values of a distribution, over the distribution, we actually end up with this thing called uh, entropy, which is the irreducible uncertainty of a, of a, of a distribution. And you, you can think about here that the max, um, think about a distribution that maximizes this, uh, which is the actually the uh, uniform distribution, right? Which is the, the most uncertain. If I, if I tell you that something is distributed uniformly between a, a point A and point B, um, 
uh, you, you haven't really learned anything. All L outcomes are uh, equally likely. Whereas um, for something that, that's peaky, you can imagine this horribly drawn Gaussian distribution. Uh, you're, you're a lot less surprised um, if you get a value around the mean, and you're a lot more surprised if you, if you, if you, get, if you see an event uh, farther away. And uh, this idea of surprise or um, is related to directly related to this idea of information. There are many, many different ways to talk about it. Um, so, but the the idea is that um, the the expected. So um, imagine now that we have a distribution Q, um, and we take the expectation. Where are we at in the training? Okay. So we take the expectation of the information of Q. And uh, this is just, just equal to expectation P. Um, log 1 over Q. Um, you can sort of think, think about this formulation is that um, if, if imagine Q is our estimate and P is the ground truth, um, on, on, on average, how much information do we gain uh, uh, by seeing, seeing the samples from Q or how, how surprised are we? Um, and this is uh, lower bounded by the, uh, this thing, which is called the en entropy. And this ends up being called the cross entropy. Um, so this um, expectation, so from x over all events, So here's the entropy. Uh, here is the cross entropy. And you can see if um, we want to, so like this metric will range from some maximum value down to the entropy, exactly. But what happens if we subtract off the entropy? Well, now the lower bound zero. And this is the definition of the Kale divergence. Forget the the notation. Which side is this? Is QP? Yeah, yeah. And are you done? Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah. So just quickly here, this is not the the, the normal form you're seeing in. People will do a bunch of algebra uh, and change things. Note that this one over becomes a. You can pull it out as a negative here, um, and also the fact that this is why it is not symmetrical. As Soham talked before. You can imagine if you swap P and Q, now you're going to be sub subtracting off the entropy of Q here. Um, yep. So a little uh, informa information theory motivation for that. And now we're going to get back to our empirical results. Right. Uh, all I did is just, just have a beta term that uh, basically scales the scale kill divergence loss um, and I and I gave um, 0 0.1 this time so uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna interrupt training because it, it, it was doing fine and let's plot the losses what we get is something expected 
And if we visualize our MNIST images, the, these are fine. And these are reconstructed. So uh, they're still going to be blurry. So but what I want to see show you is that um, you should have at least a little more of a spread in the latent space of m when you plot, plot this. So, uh, so if you see, it's, you, ha you have more things that are, uh, that are further apart from zero. And you see, the last time you had everything that was uh, between minus three and three. Um, now it's ranging from minus six to eight in the y dimension and also minus six to eight in the x dimension. So, uh, that's, uh, so that, that, that's how uh, your, you can control your latent variable values because I've um, imposed a less strong of a prior, um, then you, you have more spread in your, in your, in your data. And you can see uh, your fours and your nines here, which, are, which is your, your weird green and your brown, are slightly better separated here. So uh, if I plot something here, I think I probably will be able to better see fours and nines here. Okay, still not really, but um, I guess, yeah, you can see one four here. But anyways, um, but okay, let's see some examples in here. If we have a four, okay, so it's still being confused with the nine. But um, this plot definitely looks much better than uh, the previous plot we had where four and nine were almost uh, on top of each other. So uh, this is how important having uh, uh, good hyperparameters and a, e even a good prior is for uh, a task like this. Um, so yeah, that's, that's pretty much all we have for uh, VAEs for this recitation. I think that's good, right? Yeah, thanks. <laughs>